This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. My guest today is Jed Rothstein. He's the director of a new film, a new documentary film, The China Hustle. Executive producers include Mark Cuban, Todd Wagner, Alex Gibney. If you don't recall the name Alex Gibney, Alex was the man behind the Enron documentary, one of the great films of the last 20 years. Gosh, it might be longer than that. No, it's got to be in the last 20 years. I'm not looking it up right now, but... The Enron film was a great film. Alex was involved in that. But today it's not Enron, but perhaps some might argue that the China hustle is a kissing cousin of the Enron film. Some might argue that it's right there in the same headspace, just as bad. Others might argue something entirely different. In a nutshell, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but essentially post the Great Recession, it became very fashionable for U.S. investors to invest in Chinese companies listed on U.S. exchanges. Now, there was a whole process to this. Many people involved on both sides, from China to U.S. players. A very interesting story with many perspectives, and I think you will really enjoy checking this film out. It might make you angry for different reasons. There's going to be different perspectives on this. I felt myself looking at it from multiple angles, not just the obvious angle with the title of the film, The China Hustle. So let's jump right in with the director of The China Hustle, and let's get behind the scenes a little bit to think about this project, where Jed took it, and what we can all perhaps take away from this, the arguably latest scandal to hit. And to hit hard, a lot of people were not happy about this, but it's complicated. China, America, different systems, different languages, a whole host of cultural differences. Jed is a very smart guy and has a great perspective. Let's jump right into the conversation. Give me your first China experience that you can recall? And I I give that kind of big, broad question because you are now jumping straight into this very topical discussion about markets, investing, Chinese firms, U.S. investors. Give me some perspective for you, though, just on China, the big picture in terms of what you were thinking before you started this project. I'm not an expert on China either. Certainly, I have studied it a bit and learned about it. And I studied it. My first perspective on China was really in college when I took a course about literature and history from the Cultural Revolution. And so I learned a lot about that period, which was very fraught and tragic and difficult for a lot of people. And then I got into a group of filmmakers who emerged from that, some of whom are quite famous and accomplished Chinese filmmakers now. I think they were, I don't want to misquote the name, but I think they were called the Fifth Wave this group of amazing filmmakers, Chen Kaiga, Zhang Yimo, who are among them, who really were the first guys to start making movies again in the wake of the Cultural Revolution and in, in the opening up under Deng Xiaoping. And so I'd always been interested in China since then. I certainly followed it through the various political epochs and the Tiananmen epoch, the Hong Kong handover a little later in that decade or or seven or eight years later. So I was always really interested in China's culture and history, and I was also really fascinated by its potential. I, obviously, you know, this film talks about a wave of problematic companies and some certainly some structural problems in the emerging Chinese economy and certainly in the way that we in the West interface with the Chinese economy, and, and clearly there are problems. But I also feel like... China is kind of an amazing dynamic place. It's clearly growing by leaps and bounds. It clearly wants to be and is increasingly part of the global economy. 
And so I, all of that to me is really fascinating. And, you know, I feel like there, the question of how China integrates into the global economy is a very complex one. And for me, there's a lot of opportunity and a lot of peril. And so that was when I came into this uh, and first learned about this story and the sort of crux of this story, I thought it was, it, it had a lot of these interesting dynamics to it. And that's sort of what attracted me to it. Let me stop you there for a second before we get too far ahead. So you have this foundation, frankly, that most people probably don't have about China. They Most Americans really can't say much other than, hey, it's China, it's over a billion people, it's communist. It's about the sum total that I'd say the vast majority of Americans' knowledge of it. Paint the picture for how you came into this particular story that we're going to discuss today. How were you introduced to this particular story? So I had been working here at Jigsaw as a director on various projects, uh, up to that point, mostly television projects. The producer of the film, Sarah Gibson, approached, she had met a couple of the short sellers on an earlier, pro or one of them in particular, John Carnes, on an earlier project that she did called IOUSA. And he had turned her on to this story and introduced her to Dan David. They decided that somebody should tell this story. Dan didn't want to be in the story at all, actually. He just wanted somebody to tell it. So she decided she was going to try and make a film out of it. And she took the story to Jigsaw, and particularly hoping to get Alex Gibney, who is the executive producer of, of this film and who is the sort of head of, of Jigsaw, to make the film, because he is well-known for his... In, in Ron in particular. Right. And Alex, I think, was really, really interested in the story, but couldn't direct the film because he was already committed to some other projects at the time, but said, we'll house it. We'll partner with Kennedy Marshall, which is who another company, uh, Frank Marshall's company, who Sarah was working with at the time said, we'll partner on this and we'll find a director. So they started in meeting with different directors. And one of them was me. I don't, I'm sure I wasn't the first. I, I hope I was the last because I got the job. But eventually it, I had to meet with the people here and, I had to meet with Dan and I met with Dan, as I say in the film, I met with him in a TGI Fridays in Penn Station, which I don't know how familiar you are with New York, but I know that TGI Fridays and I also know about 20 meters away is the most disgusting bathroom in the United States of America. Penn State, you know, if you wanted to meet somebody for a <laughs> meal or even a quick drink, Penn Station would probably not be your, your top pick. Um, but we had a nice, we had a, you know, to the credit of TGI Fridays, we had a nice time and we had some we had some drinks and Dan told me this story, which I did not know anything about. I, I didn't know anything about Chinese companies becoming listed on US markets. I didn't understand anything about how that worked really, and I, I certainly didn't know that there had been this wave of really problematic companies and it was really distressing to me because it was just kind of coming on the heels of the whole world and especially the U.S. climbing out of the last financial crisis. Put a date in that, though. So we're talking about the events we're going to be talking about today were occurring within a year after the Great Recession. As I came to learn and as it as we discuss in the film, the, ma the vast wave of these problematic companies and frauds were from 2006 to about 2012. Dan would argue, certainly, there are other problematic things going on now, and we uh, allude to that in the film, although we don't really get too deeply into the present-day companies, although he did short a he does short a company at the end of the film that's that was in 2016, so I guess I'm, I'm selling us a little short. The wave of, biggest wave of the companies in this story were 2012 to 20, 20, 2006 to 2012. This meeting with Dan was after all of that. It was in 2015. This happened, that it's still going on in, in some form, and that there's really, you know, nobody who, when he raised the alarm bells about this in various places, nobody seemed to care or want to do anything about it. Let's take a, a big picture here for people. And what you're talking about is this wave of Chinese companies that get listed in the States, and instead of going through a normal, quote, IPO process— they were finding shell companies of U.S. listed companies, perhaps defunct or not really even doing anything anymore, but they were still listed. And so they did these reverse mergers to kind of automatically appear on U.S. exchanges 
boom like that, which then in turn led the ability for an assortment of people attached to the industry to then go on money raising sprees. Am I going down the right path? Yeah. I mean, there were IPOs that were problematic as well, but for, for the sake of simplicity, yes, the big, the biggest problem area was the reverse mergers that enabled them to get listed, uh, money to be raised for them and ultimately for them to be sold on markets, you know, just to, to whomever was interested in buying them, which ended up being all, all manner of people and all manner of investors, especially retirement funds, um, pension funds. And un- unfortunately for some individuals, some individuals sunk a lot of money into them. One of the things we talk about in the film is that the biggest losses occurred in this sort of big skim, this sort of giant skim off the top where a lot of people lost a little money, probably anyone with any sort of broad investments. Uh, and then of course there are some people who invested really directly in some of these companies and were, and were really hurt. Let me ask a big picture question. So it's a really nice job of filmmaking. It reels you in and you want to watch, but uh, as I just mentioned at the beginning of our conversation, I'm in that part of the world. I've been to mainland China, I've been to Beijing several times, I've been to Shanghai, uh, Shenzhen, Guangzhou, Hong Kong. Talk about the perspective, though, because as we start talking in our conversation, you mentioned the earlier stages. You know, we all know, gosh, like 500 million people have been pulled out of poverty since 1979 in China. We can all look back at periods of time where the Chinese themselves, if you you really want to look at like the Brits in colonial times, this is a a culture that goes back thousands of years. And they do, I don't know if grudge is the right word, but they've got a strong memory. So I'm curious about, because you are, and you you mentioned at the top of this, you're enlightened to a, a wider perspective. Talk about the direction, how you as a director, the producer, the writers, how you started to have this perspective for this particular film because I think it'd be fair to say it it does leave the audience with that feeling of, hmm, you know, the Chinese don't feel like very good people right now. It kind of leaves you with that feeling, don't you think? Uh, you know, people are obviously entitled to their own reactions, but my intention was certainly not to suggest that the Chinese are not good people or that China is not a good place to be involved with. My, my point is, is really the broader point to say that we have now a global and increasingly interconnected global financial system where capital can move around and investment can move around very rapidly. And the rules of the game, the regulations and the laws for transparency and accountability haven't kept up with it. And that gap in between the speed and and mobility of the money and the speed and mobility of the regulators is creates a sort of arbitrage opportunity for some bad actors because there's no consequence to, I think fraud, first of all, I think fraud is part of some level of fraud anyway, as part of any kind of economic system, having nothing specifically to do with China or anywhere else. But I think in what we saw in this story in the China hustle is that when there are no consequences and when accountability is very difficult to come by, uh, bad actors can take advantage of it. And I, I take from that that we should improve and upgrade and modernize our financial system so that it, it keeps pace with the speed at which investments are taking place. This is, was a particularly egregious example, and, it, and it's a big example because China's a big place and America is still a big market where a lot of capital can be raised. I don't feel like there's some particular problem that's unique to China. And I certainly wouldn't want anyone to think that it's has anything to do with inherent. I just don't, I don't, you know, a lot of Chinese uh, people who've seen the film have been, I've been quite moved by their reaction because they're, they want China to be a participant in the global economy and they want China to participate in the global economy on the same, you know, and as modern and fair and open a way as, as, possible. And they think this is a step towards at least making people aware of the need to do that. I think one, one of the things that you do in the film that I think is really, it's kind of subtle, but it, it forces all of us as you talk about this, 
global interconnected uh, world, that in the in the abstract um, is something we all want. But then when you get down to brass tacks and nation states and you know different international different laws for each country, different accounting standards for each country, it's that the overlap. So if if America has to deal with China, I mean it is truly two very distinct entities with their own way of doing things. That in of itself, I mean, the old Thomas Friedman book, uh, the, the World is Flat, which is true, but there's still friction. I'm familiar with the book. I haven't read it to be, you know, to admit to Mr. Friedman. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll look out. I'll try to read it. Yeah, I think there's friction. There are different accounting systems. There are different cultural systems and ways of China is a place where, as we were discussing a little earlier, it, you know, capitalism is relatively new. And there isn't a history there of free speech, which is, to me, a, a much bigger issue globally and certainly in China and in, um, in when talking about global financial systems. If you don't have free speech, if you can't openly criticize a company or a government, even if you're wrong, I think the fact of having a foundation of free speech helps, keeps mar helps keep markets honest. Um, I think short selling to me, you know, the short sellers are a complicated bunch and they are highly criticized by a lot of people here and, and certainly in China as well, as we show in the film. When you make that point about the uh, the free speech, uh, look, obviously, obviously, as an American and somebody who's been involved in finance books, uh, somebody who has strong political opinions, I hear you, I, I second you. But if I was to play devil's advocate and kind of take the Chinese position, it's an odd thing because when you go to China and you see all of this success, it's hard to rationalize from a pure American perspective because it's it's different, it's huge. I mean, I look at something like the bullet train, right? I took the bullet train in China for the first time in 2013, right? We've still got the Excella, you know, in the DC corridor. And, and it's, it's fascinating that I share your belief, but then if I put my devil's advocate hat on and look at it from the China perspective, it's tricky, isn't it? It's trick. No, and I, you know this is a debate that that I've had with with friends of mine and and friends who've lived over in China for long periods of time and worked over there. I get it. You know, they have other uh, imperatives and needs that they're addressing, but I do think that the conversation is a valid one to have in the context of Chinese companies coming to the U.S., which. They will continue to do, and I, I believe they should continue to do. I, I certainly wouldn't say, oh, we shouldn't have interaction with Chinese companies. I think that would be a mistake. But when we have these interactions, I do think for a, not just for an American financial market, but for the global markets, if you do, how, how do you have any faith that the, the materials you're reading, the audits you're reading, the publications you're reading, the statements that you're reading – are true if you don't have the ability to question them and investigate, you know, and poke around them, or at least qu ask questions about them without fear of repercussion, of legal repercussion. And I think that I agree it's a complicated big problem. And China, the Chinese economy has boomed, and as you suggest, millions, hundreds of millions of people have been lifted out of poverty. But I, I think they're, as they mature, as they become wealthier, I would hope that the drive for free speech gains strength. I mean, I, I can understand the other side of the argument, but I guess as an American and as somebody who has, I, I've done a lot more films on political topics around the world, especially in the Middle East. And I can tell you when you don't have, if you, do, if you just took the first, I mean, I know the first amendment doesn't exist in other places, but if you just took the basic tenets of the First Amendment, the right of free speech, and you map that over the globe, all of the countries that have it are, in my mind, in much better shape than the ones that don't, uh, for myriad reasons. And I think that when you're talking about these international financial issues, it's it's the key to it. I don't know I how I don't know how else you ensure especially in a large system. I mean, you you lived or you traveled and, and worked in Singapore. Perhaps in a small city state, one could enforce financial transparency and discipline in the absence of larger political free speech because it's a pretty contained system. China is enormous. It is not a contained system. And I think some 
greater measure of that would really help clear up a lot of these problems. As you mentioned, the politics, and I think it's it's something worth, I mean, we, we could we could go off in the history of these things in a, a lot of different ways for a long time. But if you look at uh, the Chinese form of government, the Vietnamese form of government, the Laotian form of government, the Cambodian form of government, all communist. And what's really interesting is that, and, and maybe I'm kind of generalizing a little bit here, but they kind of made the decision to go to the collective form of government because they were all at some point in time battling colonial powers. The ability to then say, hey, let's take our vast populations and go collective gave them power. So in many ways, it's interesting that the West, we will look at them now and these various countries and say, well, gosh, don't you see the benefits of our system? Whereas they're thinking, hold on, you were the guys with your system that came over here and caused us so many problems. Oh, yeah. I mean, we're, it's an interesting discussion, Michael, because Certainly, I, I don't. I don't think that the American form of capitalism or is the the best or only way that all countries in the world should operate. But I do think even in a collective system, and maybe there are reasons for different countries to have that. Uh, that's certainly, and I wouldn't say that's that's not for me to say. That's or for you to say. That's for the the people of those countries to say. But even in that system, I still believe that. Uh, a basic right to free speech is really important. And maybe there are ways in which that is defined a little differently from place to place or from system to system. But again, if you don't have the ability to hold political leaders accountable, business leaders accountable, civic leaders accountable, then I think it's just everything goes off the rails. It, f corruption and, and fraud are part of the human social condition, you know, the level can might be greater or lesser at different times for different reasons. But I would challenge anyone to find a culture where there's none of that. I think the question is just how do you approach it? How do you deal with it? How do you try to hold people accountable? And how do you create incentives to minimize it or, or minimize the damage that it can inflict uh, so that we have fairness, relative fairness, so that we have rule of law? I, I think that, you know, again, in this interconnected global financial world, we have not figured out the systems to, to implement this, you know, a lot of, and it's really, it's this gap that to me is really interesting because the misrepresentations and frauds on the Chinese side, in many cases were not illegal under Chinese law. In some cases they were, there were shenanigans that went on that were just illegal anywhere. And on the American side, uh, much of what was done in terms of bringing and promoting these companies was to much or, or maybe even all, some would argue, although there were some really problematic folks. But for the most part, it was legal. You know, the people were promoting legal business opportunities. Um, and what I would argue is that the system is not adequate to the task of integrating this global economic, the march towards an increasingly integrated global economy, and therefore we have these opportunities for the types of frauds that took place in the in the China hustle to take place. Let me take you to some color for a moment, in particular, uh, a personality. I thought it was a really interesting piece of filmmaking, and I'm sure you've got some feelings that you're going to want to express upon it. So one of one of the players that uh, on the U.S. side that helped to facilitate these Chinese deals, a very well-known, I think he was a general, a very well-known uh, uh, former military guy, Wes Clark. I, I would love for you to explain his role briefly, but I would also like for you to comment on what happened, because I can only imagine as a guy who once did a documentary film, when that particular scene happened, and he uh, got uh, uncomfortable, I'll let you describe the uncomfortableness, but when he got uncomfortable, I'll let you take it from there. That's that's pretty amazing stuff to get on camera, isn't it? For one thing, I would say I, I do respect General Clark, and I respect his service, and I was quite torn about how to present him in the film. I think he's done amazing things for this country, and to be honest, I wish that the person in that chair in that position were maybe somebody else or maybe a politician that I just didn't agree with as much or didn't like as much or someone who hadn't been a decorated war hero. But I do think that it's part of the, the very complicated mechanics of how things like this China hustle take place are that 
bad actors or problematic actors pair themselves with people of great reputation and leverage those reputations to put a sheen of, of to put the imprimatur of quality on things that shouldn't have it. And that happens in different ways that one way, which we talk about in the film is that people are paid or political celebrities and others are paid to give speeches at conferences and events forums. So the question arises and I asked general Clark this, well, what, what about that? Should people be giving speeches at these conferences? If the conferences, if it turns out that there are all these problematic companies, these, uh, frauds and, and material mis misrepresentations being sold there. And he said, well, you know, people give speeches. It's part of their, it's the way they earn money. And I think on some level, can you ask, uh, every, can you ask, should Colin Powell personally or have his staff vet every company that's at one of these conferences? I don't, that seems like a pretty tall order. It seems like an unrealistic expectation, but with general Clark, you know, he was actually the chairman of that one of the banks that was most involved in this, uh, Rodman and Renshaw, he was the chairman of the bank for six years. And it was really the six years during which most of this problematic activity or the bulk of it took place. While I believe him when he says he wasn't out there executing these deals, I'm sure he was not still being the chairman of something has some meaning, uh, it has financial meaning. And it also has some import in terms of lending your name to something. Again, I've conflicted about calling him out on it, but it's not something that, you know, was conjured out of thin air. And I think it is indicative of a, of a large problem in this, in this sector. And I think in our society in general, it's just, it's, it's a problem when we can rent integrity from people who have it to cover up things that shouldn't be accorded such integrity. Is it an arguable perspective from your view? Let's just, I'm going to try and carve this out, and you and you tell me if this is a fair view without it just sounding like it's Mike Covell's view, that, okay, we have actors in China that people could say are purposefully, from day one, looking to deceive on their companies right from the very beginning. Let's just say, okay, that's one perspective. Is it fair, though, to potentially say that likewise – that many of the American actors that were bringing the Chinese companies along and raising that U.S. money knew from the very beginning just as much as what somebody could say that these Chinese companies knew from the beginning, which was it was all just thin air. I'm, I'm going to try and not make it my covel, but it felt like that many of the American actors I was watching in the film were complicit. It felt like they were part of the hustle. Well, you know, they would certainly argue against that, um, as some of them did, like General Clark, um, some of the lawyers, uh, some of the stock promoters who were in there made efforts to say that they didn't know. And once they found out, I think people are really I think I'm sure there were some people involved in it who knew or had a strong inkling from the get go that this was a problem or that these companies were problematic. I think things are more complicated in reality. Um, I think people might start something thinking it's a great opportunity and then find out by parts that it isn't a great opportunity. And then when do you stop and you're already in it? I think part of the, again, part of the issue is the, the steps, which the required steps for diligence, the, the are relatively low and understanding and getting to the bottom of some of these frauds was relatively hard. So you combine those two things. And I think, you, you know, you get a situation where frauds can happen. I, I, I don't, you know, I'm sure there are some people who were involved in this whole thing who were really, you know, from the get go feeling like they could just construct fraud and steal money. But I think even on the Chinese side, I think a lot of it just has to do with slipping by inches into these things. And we talk about this in the film, Dan, the main character says, you know, a Chinese chicken farmer using it as an example of one company he's thinking of a Chinese chicken farmer doesn't wake up and decide he knows how to defraud us capital markets. There are a lot of steps in the middle of this and it has, it may have to do with somebody approaching them and saying, Hey, look, 
you've got a great business, you want to grow it, all you got to do is say that you're making more money than you are, and we're going to go out and raise all this money for you. And by the time anybody finds out, you're going to have already be make you'll already be making that much money. It will be true. I think that, you know, there is some strange element of, of starting a business or running a business that sort of involves this kind of wishful thinking anyway, right? When you, you don't start a business and dream that you're only going to be as big as you are, you start a business and you envision something bigger and better. And you envision that you're going to get there and you probably believe that you're going to get there. Look at Silicon Valley, 19 out of 20 companies go what? Right. You know, buns up. I didn't look at filmmaking. You know, you got to, to pitch a film, you got to go out and say, uh, whether it's a documentary or, or a or a fiction film. You have to say, we're going to make this story about robots invading Mars and it's going to be incredible and it's going to look like this and look like that. And we're going to make it happen. And somebody has got to believe in that vision and then go out and make it happen. Um, I think in the case of these companies, I, I believe at certain points there were definitely, you know, people were making bad choices. People were knowingly committing fraud and submitting documents to auditors and, and regulators that they knew were not true. Those were the things that were, were ferreted out, but, or, or, you know, many of those problems were ferreted out or, or in, you know, there are cases where the chairman of some of these companies would sell the same assets twice. There were cases where they would mingle the company's bank accounts with their own bank accounts and go on spending sprees. I mean, there are all sorts of situations where, look, these guys are just stealing money. There's no, there's no other explanation for it. Can I take, let me take you to a, a wider scope on this, because I think you do a, a great job for outlining this particular time period, what happened, the different actors, the different countries. I'm curious your perspective, though, if I if I broaden out and I look at something like the dot com bubble, I look at Enron, I look at Madoff, I look at the Great Recession. I really start to, because and I think I think in your film and, and, and tell me if you see differently, but it it leaves us sympathetic to middle American investors who made these often and many times big personal bets on these particular Chinese firms. And then in many cases, as you show, they lost significant money, if not all. And it, it frankly leaves us very sympathetic to some, some people that made some really bad decisions. But as I just mentioned, these other things that have taken place in the last 20 years, at what point in time do we as a society I mean, yes, there's got to be protections, but my gosh, why are people continually just doing things on the edge? And then when it all goes terrible, everyone is like looking for assistance because I didn't invest in these companies. I don't think you did, but other people did. I would say, you know, the, the question that we ask at the beginning of the film that Dan asks, that I asked Dan and he responded to really is, you know, what is capitalism? What is it? Is it a mechanism to reward the most worthy, hardworking efforts? Or is it a mechanism for people to take advantage of one another? I would hope that we, I'm, you know, I'm not a communist. I, I believe we should have market systems, but I would hope that we can inject a little more fairness into the system in the sense that we have accountability, we have transparency, you at least believe that what you're reading about a, an investment is is likely to be true, or that if it's not true, the people who are putting it forward are going to have consequences. Uh, it's true, you know, should should the system go through cycles where we everyone builds up these positions and in incredibly risky assets because they seem sexy and everything's going up and then they blow up and ask for assistance? I mean, I agree. That's problematic. You know, I, and I don't think by just to be fair to these guys in the China hustle, the, the people who the individuals who really lost a lot, they're, they're not getting any assistance from the government that I know of. I'll give you an example. Uh, something that was when I was watching your film, you had there was a guy in there and I'm not really giving away anything. It's just one particular moment. But he said, I believe the numbers were that he was in some particular uh, Chinese stocks and or, or stock and it went from nine dollars to 12 cents and it it made me recall that in one of my first books i quoted a pension manager talking about having an investment in enron 
that he held from $100 to zero. Now, never mind, never mind that Jeff Skilling got out of everything at $50 a share. This pension fund manager held a stock all the way from 100 to zero. The guy in your film held it from $9 to 12 cents. I'm thinking, hold on, are you guys seeing something wrong here? <laughs> you know? It's true. You know, any, I, I screened the film at one point for, for some financial advisors. You know, their response, I, it was, interesting to not you know it's funny to me they said well you know everyone should have a more diversified portfolio which is of course a standard issue strategy right no one would no financial advisor worth his salt would say put all of your money into chinese microcaps or into one chinese microcap i mean it would be a, a really risky strategy yes you know i think clearly uh in retrospect those were bad decisions clearly holding the stock all the way to the bottom was a bad decision but I would say to me, again, it's, it's not so much about this Ray's story. That's the person you're thinking of. It's more about the system that caused him to be in this situation. I mean, Ray is a journalist in a small town. His wife is a nurse. They are in their late sixties. They've worked their whole lives. They have no meaningful retirement from their work. And so they choose to try and invest to give themselves a little bit of money to retire on. There are ads right now from online investment companies that portray senior citizens doing jobs that they're clearly too old to do, like, you know, being the lead, you know, an 85 year old person holding a fire hose or having to lift heavy boxes all over the place. And that the point of the commercial is if you don't want to be an 85 year old still having to work use, I don't remember, I don't want to name the company if I'm not remembering it right, but, you know, use this online investment tool and invest in the markets and this way you won't have to work when you're old. And I think, you know, the ad is clearly made in jest. It's, it's a funny ad, but it is indicative of a, of a problem in our society, which is we, we kind of have made the choice that increasingly, you know, you're on your own. It's sink or swim. It's buyer beware. And so can you blame some of these people? I mean, they're not equipped to be financial experts, uh, and nor should they be. They have other jobs to do all day. So I'm, I'm sympathetic to their losses, even, even as I say, well, okay, clearly like investing all of your retirement money in this one Chinese micro cap that turned out to be very problematic and go to zero and end up in a bunch of lawsuits was not a great idea. But I still, to me, it raises the question about the larger, the larger way in which we're we're kind of building our society and, and the larger way in which we integrate the capitalist system into what we, the choices we make as a society. Because many of these same people that we're discussing, these older folks that perhaps feel boxed in and don't have a way out. I mean, what's really, what's, this is kind of a side tangent, but what's really frightening about America right now is that we are essentially, and this is through government sponsor, we are shuffling these folks into casinos to sit there and blow their money in casinos all weekend long, too. So it's a it's a really frightening perspective from that. I mean, the government sponsoring casinos everywhere and and older folks going there and sitting all day long because they feel threatened. And that's their only way out. That's just as bad. That's kind of a side note. But I, I figure you probably would relate to that one. I mean, look, if people have fun and they're and they're playing at some level that's not materially important that they can afford, then I guess, you know, it's, I don't. I don't think it's a bad form of entertainment, but yeah, if they're going in and hoping to actually sustain their, their retirement on ga gaming winnings, that's a, a terrible problem, of course, because they, they don't build the casinos because they pay out more money than they take in, obviously. I, I actually, years ago, got a guy on camera to admit a young guy, and the reason he played the lottery was because that was his retirement. I have one, one more kind of detailed question before we kind of wrap up. The big four accounting firms, I mean, for all of this stuff to take place, and maybe this is where I think most people can probably really start to say, this is unsavory. But, you know, at the top of this food chain are these multinational accounting firms that really set the stage for the smoke and mirrors for all of the financial shenanigans to, to unfold. Because let's face it, if we had to go back in time, these very same accounting firms that, that make up part of your story today, these were the same goofballs that were probably signing off on Enron's fake trading floor 20 years ago. And it's, it's, uh, and they just keep their power and they keep moving through. It looks nice and, and they got big billboards and fancy offices. 
But they they really set the stage for bad actors, don't they? In the China hustle, a lot of the bad companies, problematic companies, at first were audited by these smaller firms. And then at a, at a certain point, these the big four became involved and there was a big lawsuit at one point that they weren't turning over work papers. That gets into this larger issue of whether China will even let the, the Chinese arms of these companies share their work papers, which is a big part of the problem of the lack of communication between the regulators. But I, the reason I thought it was important to mention those firms is the same reason that I wanted to mention the political celebrities who speak at and and share and lend their names to these some of these problematic actors and that's because i think that is you know we're we're placing our faith in these respected entities and maybe we should be asking more questions about why we're doing that because the system is not really set up to ensure the accountability that we need. And so we are sort of at the moment, we are sort of buyer be we're in a buyer beware situation. And whether, whether you think that attached, I think, you know, that in and of itself shouldn't be a stamp of approval um, any more than any of these, the big banks or, or little banks or anybody else. I think we're until we modify the system and create a system with more transparency, we're all sort of, or we're, we're sort of on our own, unfortunately. Yeah, holding your breath for that, though, are you? You know, after I finished this film, I wanted to put all of my my retirement savings under a mattress. <laughs> Those conferences in Southern California with the rock bands and all that kind of stuff, I mean, like, if, if one is in the middle of that and one thinks they're in the middle of a positive investment, and you look around and you're in the middle of that crowd, your wallet is long gone. It's like any of these problems that you mentioned before, like the, the, uh, the original dot-com boom, the mortgage crisis, you know, when things are going well, when everything's going up, everything's going up. And when it's going down, uh, you know, who gets off the ship first? I don't have any problem with people having a, a party and, you know, playing music and whatever. I think it's great, but I think we should just be, we all should just beware, as you say, you know, there's no, there's nobody really looking out for you, but you, and there's, and the, and the people in the financial industry who take fees to advise about these things are in many cases not really looking out for for our interests um and in fact you know there's a a a debate now about the fiduciary rule um one of the things that that president trump is trying to do is roll back all sorts of financial regulations one of the ones up i don't know where exactly it stands at this moment as we're talking but i know one of the ones they're trying to scale back or remove was this fiduciary obligation, which, which I can't believe hadn't been in place until a few years ago, which is that your financial advisor has to, has to operate in to the fiduciary benefit of his or her client, meaning they couldn't suggest products to you without disclosing if they had an interest in it. And they couldn't suggest products to you that were not in your best interest. This to me seems like a no brainer. If you're paying somebody to advise you, you know, but they want to remove that the 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 lobbyists for the financial advisory interests and and for the banks. It's yeah, I'm not holding my breath for a situation where we don't have buyer beware, but I, I do think we can have some greater measure of accountability and transparency, and I do think we can bring the the laws for uh, international finance somewhat up into the 21st century because, as I said before, the money is up up in the 21st century. It's only going to get faster. The, the the discussion when I leave the film now, people are start talking about cryptocurrency and Bitcoin. I was just going to say that might be the next fraud to, to go tackle. You know, I don't want to uh, cast dispersions on those that industry. I don't know enough about it personally, but I'll just say that it's very complicated. Look, there's some, there's some great innovations with the blockchain. Some of these cryptocurrencies are going to do really well and all that kind of stuff. But there's all there's a huge number of bad actors in there, uh, you know, rolling up the game and getting ready to play ball. Yeah. Well, so listen, you didn't think you could 
talk for an hour. I think we've proven that wrong. I appreciate you coming on. And you know, my, my objective today was to not try and repeat the film. And I think we got what I wanted, which was to have a kind of nice corollary conversation, kind of an adjunct to the film. And so I, I appreciate you coming on and kind of going with me in a little bit of side tangents. And I, I think this hopefully will whet people's appetite to go check the film out. I hope so. And please, uh, you know, please remind people it comes out March 30th uh, in theaters and number of cities and, and uh, Amazon, iTunes, etc. So will, will they be able to go straight to watch online as well? Yes, day and date. I, you know, I can't speak to every international market, but I know that they are eventually it should be out most everywhere, but certainly in North America. Any website you would like people to, we can direct them to? I think if they just Google The China Hustle, it will go to the right place. TheChinaHustleFilm.com. TheChinaHustleFilm.com. You raise a lot of issues. China is a really interesting subject. And I, I would say for most people, even listening to our conversations, seeing your film, you might want to throw a third leg on that stool uh, to our conversation, your film. And I, I, would, I would highly recommend to people to just go to China. I mean, it's pretty easy. To, it's really easy to get a visa. Just go and see, uh, try and wrap your arms around uh, the size and scope of this baby. Because I got to tell you, you stand there in Shanghai or Beijing and it's just a whole different world. Yeah. I, look, again, the film is not a, an effort to say, don't go to China or don't, don't have anything to do with China or don't invest in China. That's not my, my aim at all. I just think, you know, let's let's build a better system that we can all participate in. And, and until we do that, be careful. Jad, thank you for the good conversation. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you, Michael. It's been a pleasure. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money. Trend following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.